Um, just firstly, a, a little point. You've all got a pen and a piece of paper under your feet. Um, I'm just going to ask you to do a quick drawing later, and I think the professor's also asked you to do a couple of things, so it's just to make sure everybody had a pen and a piece of paper. So it's nothing intricate, so don't worry about that. So good evening. My name is Peter Cosgrove. So myself and Professor Ian Robertson are going to give you an interesting talk through how to be memorable at an interview, um, some of the anecdotes and some of my uh, views on it, as well as probably the more scientific side that um, Professor Ian Robertson will cover. So before I start, I really just wanted to get an understanding of who the audience is today. So I kind of thought there's three sorts of people here. There's people who are interested in jobs, recruitment, careers. Uh, there's people who are interested in memory. And then there's somebody else, just in case you're the third one. So can I just get a quick um, hand raise for anybody who's number one? Anything to do with jobs, careers, job seeker, interested in careers? Okay. Number two here, because you're interested in memory. And then the dreaded one, who's number three? Okay. Number three? I have no idea where you're at, so that's going to be interesting. Okay. Maybe you can ask me questions afterwards. Okay. So I plan to speak for about 20 minutes. Um, my knowledge and exp expertise with about 15 years of doing interviews with candidates and what's made them memorable and what hasn't made them memorable. The first thing I suppose I'll just be clear about an interview. There's a lot of talk about interview. If you've ever gone through an interview, most people at one stage in their life have gone through one. The only things that matter, regardless of how many stages you go through and how many people you meet, can you do the job, do you want the job, and do we like you? And sometimes it's important to remember that because you end up getting completely confused about all the things that matter at an interview. But it comes down to that. Do you have the skills? Do you really want this job? So there is a huge difference, especially in today's market, between the job and a job. A lot of people interview for a job, and it's so clear to the client or the interviewer that you don't really care about this company, you're just looking for a job. And then finally, do we like you? And there is a lot you can do. So everything we talk today is, can help with one of these three things. So first thing when I talked about um, memory, the first thing I thought about was, when I'm doing this, I said, what makes somebody memorable at interviews? And unfortunately, the first thing I thought about were probably not the good things, because you can be memorable for all the wrong reasons. So I thought about a few examples. The first one was a guy about 10 years ago who I met, and he was very nervous, and he asked for a cup of coffee, which he never asked for a drink at interview, because as he did, he went over to shake my hand, a big, strong shake of the hand, and his tie went straight into the coffee. And to be honest, he just never really recovered after that. It just, you know, so anything like that is not a good start to your interview process. The second one was a guy who came in and obviously had a nice meal, but hadn't checked himself in the mirror afterwards and had a nice bit of green just stuck in his teeth. And I'm a bit embarrassed about it, a bit of shame, but I couldn't really listen to anything he had to say at interview. All I was interested in was that green going to dislodge throughout the whole interview. And it didn't, it stayed there for the full 40 minutes. But it just shows that things can distract you very, very easily. The third one was an uh, American lady who came in and said she was uh, desperate for the job. She'd do anything to get the job, and by the way, she was very adventurous. Now, <laughs> She didn't get the job, just so we're clear. And she didn't look like Sharon Stone, but maybe uh, Ian can tell me why we maybe make our own memory seem a little bit nicer after the fact as well. So we're not talking about what makes you memorable from a negative side, but we want to talk about what are the positive things. So what can help us? And I've broken this down into three headings, three ways we can talk about memorable. The first is your first impression. So maybe the first 30 seconds, the first minute that you walk into an interview. The second one is our ability to structure our answers and to tell stories, or a nation of storytellers. And then the third one, which I'll probably spend the most amount of time, is about your rapport and brand. And that's quite a broad topic around your appearance, your physiology, your attitude, how you come across. And I think it's absolutely key, especially in today's environment. So I'm going to kick off with the first impression. Whether you like it or not, there's four things that somebody will immediately clock when you come in to see them in an interview. The first 30 seconds. Your eye contact whether you give them a nice firm handshake, what you're wearing, and whether you smile or not. And whether people know it or not, they will have a certain bias depending on what somebody does. And if you want to be memorable for the right or wrong reasons, you need to get these right. And these things are 100% in your control. Whether we like it or not, we like somebody to look us in the eye, especially at an interview. And if somebody doesn't, we usually think one of two or three things. One, they've got something to hide, I can't trust them, Maybe they're not telling the truth. Now, anyone knows anything about liars, liars actually generally do look you in the eye. But that's kind of what we've been taught, that if somebody's not looking in the eye, there's something to hide. The second thing is they're shy, they're being rude, 
and therefore why would I want to hire somebody like this? Or third, it might just be, do they not even have the cop on to know that they're not looking in the eye? Do they not have enough emotional intelligence or do they not get any feedback from anyone to realize this is just something you don't do? So whether you like it or not, if you're getting this wrong, you might be going through the next 30 minutes but the interview may already be over. Secondly is dress sense. And I'll talk more later about brand and rapport, but just the basics of dress sense. If you've ever watched five women sitting at a coffee shop and another woman walking in and they all give her the once over in about two seconds, they've already made their opinion. Okay, men do it as well, obviously, probably for a slightly different reason. Um, dress sense isn't about money and it isn't about wearing the best and the most expensive clothes. To give you an example, there's a former t-shirt for the art. <laughs> When he wore this quite a few years ago at the G8 Summit, somebody had obviously told him this was a good idea. He was front page of nearly every Irish paper, but guess what, not really for the right reasons, but Banana Man, um, custard, mustard, canary yellow, whatever colors you want. Now this probably looks great on somebody with you know, an Italian kind of look, but I'm not sure it works well on the Irishman, even with all his makeup. So the important thing is, for whatever reason, appearance is what we expect to see from the person. So it's not about you, it's about them. If you look at someone who we all think is of sartorial elegance, we think of Barack Obama. And everyone says, oh, we always dress it so well. But actually, if you really look at what he dresses like, he wears a dark suit, a white shirt, and maybe a blue tie. It's not exactly exciting, but you notice the man, not the clothes. <coughs> and an interview, it's really important that you don't go in if you're a guy with the piano tie or the cartoon tie, or if you're a woman, you go in with a very low cut top, or anything that immediately somebody has got a negative interpretation because you're just not really fitting into what they want to see. So you've got to be very clear in terms of the first impression. We have so many visual receptors. As someone said, if the world was 24 hours, we'd only start speaking in the last five minutes. So we have so much more than we do visually than we do in any other way. So we've got to be very clear about people will make an assumption based on what, how we dress. Thirdly is the wet, limp handshake. Does anyone recall a time when they got that wet, limp, kind of sleazy, as some people call it, and you can see a few people looking disgusted in the audience, so I hope you're thinking of that and not something else. Um, it happens all the time, and people remember it, and they remember it for the wrong reason. Now, everybody is hopefully told when they're 10 or 12 to have a good, firm handshake, not to crush the other person, but very simply, a lot of people get nervous, and they sweat, and they've got perspiration on their hand, and they're not able to just say, well, if I hold my hand like this, dry out my hand, or more simply, I just put my hand on something cold before I meet the person or a cold metal chair, and I'll have a dry hand. And actually, the person really doesn't like that wet handshake, and it makes them feel awkward, icky, and it can't help but affect the interview. Because as I'll talk a little bit while we talk about the science of interviewing, interviewing, there is a lot of biases in there that you can't do much about. The fourth thing I've said is a smile. We're not in the best time at the moment economically in Ireland, you might as well have a sunny disposition because guess what, if the interviewer is interviewing six or seven people in the day, they'd like at least talk to somebody who's got a happy, smiling face. And it does make a difference. So be very clear that you're not going to smile when you walk into the room. Even if you're nervous, it's just a smile. We're not asking you to make them roll around the eyes laughing. But the fact is, if you're frowning, if you're not looking happy, it comes through and it comes through to the interviewer. So that's the first impression. So the good thing is, all of those four things you can have a lot of control over, and therefore you can be remembered for the right reason. And the interesting thing is a lot of people go to interview almost get themselves out of the equation, and they're already not going to get the job based on something simple like that. Again, you might argue it's not fair. People shouldn't judge somebody on that. I'm not saying they do. I'm just saying that people do have biases. Not just in interview. People do that when they're dating, when they go to meetings, when they meet people in any situation, when they're networking. They make decisions based on the first 30 seconds. You know, if I met somebody recently, I shook their hand and went, hi, my name's Peter, and they shake my hand and go, hi. You immediately go, you, how are you? You know, I don't know your name, but I've introduced my name. But some people just don't recognize that. That was Barack Obama, so I probably should know I'm doing um, So that's first impression. The second thing is about structuring answers and telling stories. When anybody goes to interview, the one thing we tell them to do is prepare. It makes more sense than anything else. 70 to 80% of all questions you can, you can uh, work out what they're going to be. The first question is nearly always, tell me about yourself. But a lot of people don't prepare for it, and therefore they still hurt through it or don't know how they should say or how long they should talk for. 
But if you prepare a lot of examples and have a lot of things to say, regardless of what the question comes up, you're going to come back with a logical, structured answer, basically with a start, a middle, and an end. It might sound really basic, but the amount of people who launch into a story and you don't know when they did this or how they did it and there was no result. Because the fact is, if you come across structured an interview, whether you like it or not, people presume you're a structured, organized person. And you might just be very good at learning off interview questions and very good at an interview, but they can't know anything else. Some people say the person being an interview you never meet again. I'm not saying that always happens, but the fact is you are well to be well prepared. The other thing is telling stories. We're a nation of storytellers, but the importance of story is, you've heard the phrase, facts tell and stories sell. Very few interviewers I meet, when they leave a room, and, and you have to imagine, they might have seen six or seven people in a day, and then they don't actually make the decision for about two days later. They're not saying, do you remember the guy who gave that really great answer to question 3B? They're saying things like, who is the guy who told the story about the parachute? Who is the girl who mentioned that computer program virus that you sorted out? We are much more connected. I'm sure Professor Ian Rockson can talk a little bit more why we remember stories, but we definitely remember it a lot more than we do facts. The second thing is, when you're telling a story, you generally come out of yourself a bit more because the story is easy to remember, it's personal to you, and more of you comes out of the interview. When we're talking about things we've learned by rote, we come out a little bit mechanical and a little bit like a robot. And that comes across at the interview. So telling stories is great. The challenge with telling stories is sometimes we can forget them. As someone said, when you're under pressure, and often you are, some of you might have heard the quote, the human brain starts working the moment you're born and never stops until you stand up and speak in public. <laughs> and if anyone's stood up in public before, there are times where you just panic and you can't remember what you have to say next. And two seconds up here in silence feels like 100 seconds, or 100 seconds here to two seconds there. But with that in mind, that's only because I'm doing all the talking. If I was to ask for a volunteer, you suddenly you're all going to get a little bit more nervous. But what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to ask somebody to volunteer, so I'm not going to make anyone do this. Would anyone like to raise their hand if they're good at maths or arithmetic? Don't need to be a superstar. Anyone here is good? You're good? Great. Okay. What's your name? Denisa. Okay. So I'm going to ask you one question. Okay. Now see, the first thing I'll say is the fact that these actually put her hand up probably makes her memorable. And if you're in a large interview, and this is, by the way, one big interview, we just haven't told you, she's already one ahead of the rest of you. So I'm just going to ask you one question. Imagine when you were going for a role with a numerical bias, like an accountancy role or an actuarial role. What do you do, by the way? You're studying architecture, but you've got a good knowledge of maths. You're an old renter. Right. Um, so the question I'm going to ask you is very simple. You're in an interview, and it's a mathematical question. I'm just going to say to you, what is one sixteenth expressed as a decimal? Yeah. What is it expressed as a decimal? No pressure. Zero point sixteen. Zero six two five. Now. The reason I ask that is, if you ask anybody that in an interview, it doesn't mean you don't know the answer. It's 144 people are waiting for you to give the answer, and uh, Denise is the only one actually put her hand up to do it. But the point is, I'm sure you'll know, cover this later, why is it that what we know quite easily, if we're anyway good at maths, it wasn't a simple question. The point is, if we know our, math, our maths, we'd probably work it out. But you feel like you have to answer the question in three or four seconds, otherwise you fail. And guess what? Some answers you don't know in three or four seconds. So thank you for these volunteers. Thank you. The third thing I want to talk about is rapport brand. Now this is really a concept around your physiology, how you come across, your attitude, so many things. So the important thing is, I talk about the word brand. I want you all to think about brand for a second. You all have a personal brand. I'm gonna put a word up on the screen, and I'd like you to shout out a company in the world you think it represents. Now we all know there's thousands, tens of thousands of companies in the world. I'm gonna put up one word. Can you just, would you mind just shouting out a company you think this word represents? Volvo. <laughs> wow, very good. So it could have been any word in the world, and sometimes people shout Durex. Uh, so it depends on how you think. If you're not dirty minded, it's a regular crowd. I'll I'll, now that you all understand that, I'll throw one more word and you can shout out uh, any company in the world that's linked with one word. Pretty, a lot of companies out there. So any company in the world? 
Oh, so this is in unison. <laughs> so one word represents a company. That's pretty powerful. The reason I'm highlighting this is you all have a personal brand, and you, even if you don't want one, you have one. When you walk into a room, somebody makes your own opinion on you. So you have a brand. So the most important thing, thing I'd like you to start working out is what is your personal brand? Because it will make a huge difference in interview. The first challenge I'll tell you is, guess what? There are biases that I talked about before that you can't get over. So for instance, there's an inordinate amount of CEOs out there that are over six foot tall. So if you're under six foot tall, you've probably less chance of being a CEO. Is that fair? Is it right? Probably not, but there's the research. Secondly, if you've got a beard, the studies of 5,000 people, this isn't me talking, says that you might come across more masculine, but you also come across as somebody who's less trustworthy and most possibly even less hygienic. Okay, so apologies to anyone in the audience with a beard. Now chances are you might get a job if you're more creative. But you'll see very few people in politics, in accountancy, in law with beards. It's almost just not done. No real reason for it, but that's what the studies tell us. The third picture is a picture of President Warren Harding from the US, who was president of the US from 1921 to 1923. In 1921, the Republicans couldn't work out who they wanted as their nominee for president. And they had two nominees, and they couldn't work out which one they wanted. So they had to pick a third, one that they were both happy with. And Warren Harding became the choice. And he became the choice for anyone who's read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blake, because he was tall, he looked the part, he dressed well, he had the voice of a president, Basically, he looked presidential. By all accounts, he was one of the worst presidents they ever had. Um, and it only lasted two years. He died in 1923, but um, some say he wasn't the most intelligent. But the fact is, he got the job because he looked presidential. Why is that important? Because when you go into an interview, it's very important that you think, what is that person thinking themselves? When they start recalling what they think a good candidate is going to look like, they have a view. And you can't make yourself taller. You can't get rid of a beard. There are certain things you can do and you can't do. It's not all with our eyes though. We've things we recall because of smell. So if you walk into an interview and you absolutely kill the person with the smell of aftershave or perfume, chances are they're not going to be very happy. But that's a minor distraction compared to if they smell the aftershave or perfume that reminds them of an ex-wife or an ex-husband that they really don't like. Whether you like it or not, they'll attribute that to you and that won't work very well in your face. So maybe only a little dab of aftershave or perfume if you're going in because you never know who's on the other side of the desk. Also, if you have eaten onions or garlic and smell, unless you're going into meat a vampire, it's probably not a good idea. But I'll even tell you a story for myself in terms of cigarettes. I was interviewing child minors a few years ago, and five of them came to the house, and the second one came and I took her coat, and the coat just smelled cigarettes. And whether I like it or not, I got this picture of a 19th century woman with a fag in her mouth and lots of little kids, filthy little kids running around. But I don't know why I got it, but that was just the image that came into the back of mind. And guess what? She wasn't going to get the job even though she might have been, and I wasn't even rabid anti-smoking, but that's just the way it is. We make our preconceptions very, very quickly, not just with our eyes, but also with our smell. Also, we have to look at how we project. At interview, we need to be somewhat relaxed, and it's a pretty nervous time. So if you think about it, if you've had a very relaxing day, sitting in the park, doing yoga, having a sauna, having a cup of coffee, and you arrive at the interview, Versus if you've brought two screaming kids and maybe you've got milk over in one shoulder as you're trying to feed a child and then you're stuck in traffic for an hour. It's going to make a huge difference to how you come across. And even if you think, no, I'm relaxed, I'm relaxed, I'm relaxed, it comes out in some way with it's doing this or people know it without knowing. They don't know why they know it, but they just feel you're a bit more tense. And I had a situation myself with a candidate years ago who I was putting forth for interview and he arrived late. So he arrived late. And then he got a bit annoyed with the receptions because he arrived a few minutes late and said to her, look, will you, you know, I've got an interview. He didn't feel she went quick enough because he was already late and he said it to her again, snapped her slightly. Very dangerous given a lot of receptionists and organizations are somewhat related to someone else and she happened to be related to the MD. So guess what? She gave the feedback to the MD and he was never going to get the job. But all because it was his own fault. You've got to be careful how you react to that. <coughs> Cordelia Fine wrote a book, A Mind of Its Own, which talks a lot about how the mind plays tricks on us. And I just like the story around there's two rooms. In one room, there's radishes and lovely cookies, and the people are allowed to eat either. In the other room, there's radishes and cookies, but they're told, you cannot eat the cookies. You're not allowed. They might smell lovely, but you cannot eat them. 
An hour later, they were given what looked like a completely separate puzzle, which was, in fact, unsolved. And what they realized was all the people who had resisted eating the cookies gave up a lot more easily. It was as if there was only a certain amount of resilience you had during the day. So maybe when you arrive at an interview, arrive, relax, don't have had the most taxing day you've ever had because you're probably going to give up a lot more easily when you get asked a few challenging questions. Old, young, experienced, not experienced, we also project this. We also don't come across believable a lot of the time when we <coughs> think, have I enough experience for this? Am I too old for this job? Are they going to think I'm too old? So I've asked you all to have a piece of paper. So before you pick it up, all I want you to do is do a drawing. Okay? For 30 seconds, you don't need to be able to draw. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to look at any of the drawings. Can you just draw a picture of an old person? Okay? Just draw a picture of an old person. Okay, so you can put down your pen. Don't worry, you can work on it later. If you want to bring it home, you can. Um, can I just ask how many people drew a picture which was anything like a person in a Zimmer frame, a um, walking stick, or a wheelchair? Hands up if you did any of those. Jesus, okay. Uh, did anyone know one worse? Have someone in bed or a great <laughs> Hands up, anyone? Okay. Um, and how many people drew a sporty old person? One, two, two, three, three, four. Okay. So it highlights a lot about it. I said old, I didn't say dead. Okay, but we have our own views, and the view we have projects to the other person, and that's what they remember when they leave the room. I just didn't feel they wanted it. I didn't feel they were right to the road. So just be aware of that. Interestingly, Michelangelo was doing some of his best work until he died at 89. And there's a very interesting study uh, Harvard did between Chinese and American uh, students. When they did it at the age of 25, their memories were very similar. As you know, there's a whole memory experience, uh, experiment going outside. But when they did it again in their 70s, because the Chinese revere old people and actually think of it as a good thing, Chinese memories were a hell of a lot better than the Americans, who old is looked on as a negative and a bad thing. So it's interesting that that can actually make a difference to some of these memories. Coming near the end now, attitude. Your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. Or simply put, your, it's your will, not your skill. If five or six people go in for interview and they all are basically accountants, so they've all fit the criteria to get in front of them, the person wants the person who's most passionate, interested in the role. This doesn't mean you have to jump over the desk with a marching band. It depends on the type of role you're going for. But you can be interesting, passionate, and telling stories. And having, an interest, and having the interviewer go away and go, that was interesting. And the reason I highlight that is that recently one of the directors in our business came out of a range of interviews and said, oh, the first guy, he was just brilliant. He was amazing. Oh, I love the guy. Nothing factual. All emotion. All, came, all they recalled were the you know, feeling they had in the room when they were interviewing this person, which is very interesting. Should have said, well, she answered question 2B and 4B very quickly, very interesting. No, it was just about how you felt. So that feeling is very, very powerful in terms of how you feel with it. So you have to decide you're going to be Tigger or you are for anyone who got kids. Finally, almost last, for anyone who realizes um, last week we uh, tragically lost against the Welsh because of the throw in. So for anyone who isn't aware of this, um, the Welsh scored a try uh, where the wrong ball was thrown in, the Welsh scored the try, and then the referee went over to the line and then asked, was the right ball? Uh, and the linesman said, yes because a lot of people don't like saying, I don't know. This is just a personal observation. We've seen this a lot in interviews. People don't like saying, I don't know, because it looks weak. Or it's actually, in that sense, it would have been a very powerful thing. So guess what I don't know? They would have seen the camera. They would have just done a video camera, and they would have found out that actually it wasn't, and then everything would have been fine. But in interview, a lot of people don't like saying, I don't know, so they prefer to lie. And remember, if you lie, you must have a great memory. Good memory, great memory. It's very important that you do because people will find you out. And again, not just in what you say, but it's back when people say, I just didn't feel right. Something didn't work out. I wasn't really sure what it was. It's coming out somewhere. So, to summarize, memory links your first impressions, structuring out some storytelling, and your rapport and your brand. To be memorable at interview, you can do things with all three of those things. And you can actually come across much more memorable. If you have the choice and the six people at interview, try and go first or last, I'll leave that up to Professor Ian to talk you a bit more. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Ian Robinson. Okay, we'll do a little warm up. Uh,
task here. I want you to, uh, but anyway, oh yeah, one here. I'm going to ask you a question, but first I'm going to get you to do some sums. And I want you to, when the question comes, answer it immediately. Don't stop and think about it. And just say the first thing that comes into your mind. So, you ready? Okay, don't write them down. Follow them as quickly as possible. You've got to do each calculation before you have finished the uh, previous one. And you don't need to write down the remember the answers. Okay, no memory involved. Okay. Just do it. Okay, start. How much is 15 and 6? 65 and 9. 23 and 7. 11 and 6. 4 and 18. 15 and 6. 12 and 7. Come on, those hard. One more. 12 and 20. Right. Now, quickly think of a color in the tool and write it down. Color in the tool. Then if you write down red hammer. <laughs> Hands up if you wrote down red hammer. Okay, just call me Darren. Uh, okay, so let me explain. Did, have any put down red? No. Many put down hammer. Okay, right. Okay, so one back. Okay, one back. Um, what's happening here? Well, uh, what I was doing in giving you these sums was I was using up a very limited resource, a critical resource called working memory. Uh, working memory is what you need for thinking on your feet. It's what you need for interviews. Uh, and it's a very limited capacity. So working memory is what you need if you're trying to follow instructions for assembling an IKEA wardrobe and you're trying to, or if you're trying to work out whether you've been overcharged or <coughs> hard. Uh, it's that temporary storage of information uh, that's constantly changing. And it's the frontal and parietal parts of the brain with some of the deep midbrain structures that do this. And um, it's a limited resource. What I did was I used up that working memory and then I asked you to come up with a response. And the reason you came up with red hammer was this is a very, red is the most common color. It's most strongly coded in your brain and hammer is the most common strongly coded tool. And so when I used up this kind of working memory <coughs> conscious capacity part of your brain, it was automatic pilot bubbled up on the basis of the strength, low-level strength of representations in the temporal lobes of your brain of these. So it kind of bubbled up automatically without conscious control. And that's the basis of cliché, and that's the basis of habit. Um, and cliché and habit are necessary for life. If we had to use our working memory capacity the whole time, well, we couldn't do everything we do because not enough of it, there's too many things to think and do, and we do work and have it. And that's one reason why it's so hard to lie. Because um, when you're lying, um, or, or, or if you're trying to think on your feet, um, it's very hard against habits or things that are stored in your brain subconsciously or uh, you know, bubbling up. Okay? So this working memory capacity is, is very, very important. And the lesson here is, if you're, is what we heard is about practice and rehearsal. Now you don't, we'll come on to stories in a minute, but you don't want to be leaving everything to your working memory when you're in an interview. So you want to, you want to have anticipated as many of the questions as you can. And you want to have rehearsed these questions, and preferably you want to have practiced with a friend, or even better, a couple of friends, a few times, so that you don't have to <coughs> think about working memory. It's usually working memory to think about your response. You can let it bubble up to some extent, like a bread hammer bubbles up there. 
Now, okay, what I want you to do is, now don't write this down. I want you to uh, read this number, and then, once you've read it, write it down, okay? Nine, two, three, eight, six, four, five, seven, one. Okay, now write it down. Can't remember. I have to wait until you tell This is my working memory. It was occupied while I was doing that, so I wasn't able to store the memory. Has everyone written it down? Okay, 9338, 4571. Okay, how many of you got the 9? Okay, I'm going to do a rough graph here. So where this is the number of people. Okay, I'm going to do that there. How many of you got the 1? Sorry? Sorry? Yes, the last one, sorry. I meant the last digit, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's about that. Okay. <coughs> How many of you got the six? Well, you're all pretty good. Yeah, I have to count you. I'm going to do this as it should. Well, okay, I'll go and put that there. It's slightly fewer. How many of you got the eight? You're all too smart, that's the problem. <laughs> so, here's what you should look like, and I'll explain why. <laughs> you are too good, so I'm sorry. I'm going to make up my, take my data here. <laughs> that's what I, not only you do this speaking only, not just presenting visually as well, so I helped you out presenting visually. But this is the classic uh, curve for memory. It probably would have worked out if I had time to count you all, but I don't. You're more likely to remember the first and the last numbers in, and the reason is uh, you're capitalizing on two different types of memory in remembering this. The last numbers are stored in short-term memory, called phonological memory. Okay. And that's the kind of memory you need for looking up an unfamiliar phone number and uh, dialing it. It's a short-term store that's linked to working memory, but it's a simple, it's not really working memory because you're not manipulating it, you're just temporarily storing it. And <coughs> you're, but from the time you're, for these earlier numbers, they're beginning to go into long-term memory, okay? So memory is in many different forms and I'll talk about some of them, but one critical distinction between the long-term and the short-term memory, and in an interview, you've, you're critically trying to get your interviewers, your impressions and your answers, to get it from there into there, okay, to get it stored, because most of what we remember, we forget. We don't even get them to remember. So for instance, if you went to a doctor, the average person who's into a doctor for a consultation, and it can be a very serious consultation, only remembers between 40 and 80%, sorry, immediately forgets between 40 and 80% of what the doctor tells them, no matter how important. So you, most people forget most of what they hear, and interviewers are no different. So you've got a big challenge, and Peter gave some brilliant tips and ideas of how you're getting from that short term into the long term memory. <coughs> so, short-term memory seconds, long-term memory is minutes, hours, and days. And in the brain, <coughs> the critical elements for getting memories into long-term memory are that uh, lovely blue uh, limbic system of the brain, the hippocampus, a critical part of the brain for laying down new memories. But it does so in conjunction with the frontal lobes, particularly the left frontal lobe. And that's why if your working memory capacity is uh, used up as an interviewer with thinking, oh my God, would you look at that? 
thing on their teeth, a green piece of cabbage on their teeth, or, or if you're thinking, God, is he really, you know, what's that tie? What, what is there on that tie? Or, or, or there's something about you that's just focusing their attention, you will then be losing the capacity to lay down, go from short-term into long-term memory. Be, your interviewers will be memory handicapped by the distraction of whatever it is about you that they're focusing on. Um, now, okay, even if you get your memory stored effectively into long-term memory of the interviewer, memory is a subject to interference, particularly if you're sitting all day or maybe for several days interviewing a lot of different people. Memories are jumbled up. You get the memory of one person marriages into another. And so your task is not just to get you your characteristics into long-term memory, you want to make them more robustly embedded into the brains of the interviewers. And the more, the more robustly embedded they are, the less likely they will be to be interfered with by the, uh, the previous uh, other interview candidates. And this is one reason why it's better, if you can, to be near the beginning or near the end, uh, because uh, at the beginning uh, you benefit from less interference because you're the first candidate, and similarly from the end there's less interference. Now you don't always have the choice, but that primacy is called the primacy and the recency effect is quite a powerful one. But one way you can build memories in your interviewers that are more resistant to interference is um, to try and not just use abstract language. Because abstract language doesn't embed itself in the brain nearly as effectively as concrete language, and particularly concrete language that's associated with images. And that's one reason why, that's one of the reasons why stories, as Peter said, are so important. Uh, if I read you a list of words like pride, <coughs> uh, so I can't even think of some, sorry, I can't do a dual task here. Right? If I read that, I should have them written down. If I read you some abstract words and then some concrete words like cloud, rain, cow, you'll remember the concrete words far better. Why? Because they have images associated with them that are much more readily coming to mind automatically than the abstract words. And when you, uh, if you're trying to remember something, if you create a visual image of that, then that visual image will activate a whole different set, a whole, a whole additional set of networks in the brain. Your visual image will, exhibit, it will activate occipital cortex, for instance. Um, and the more brain cells you have switched on at the time of encoding a memory, the more likely it will be that you will remember that. So, so just in practical terms, in the interview, um, yes, say, you know, I've got a lot of experience managing, uh, you know, junior solicitors. Uh, for instance, when I worked in so-and-so, I had several young students. So if you, give, if you give an example, or even better, a little story that illustrates the abstract point, you will, first of all, because what the interviewers will have their scoring sheets and will be wanting to assess you on some abstract dimension like management experience, so you have to make sure you don't miss out on the abstract statement. But their memory for that, their ability to retrieve that fact, will be greatly helped if you can give an example. Or, or, or even better, a story without being too discursive. Because that would be more original. So, a second reason why stories are important is they're, they're incredibly powerful ways of packaging information. So if we look at this number, for instance, um, if I just get you to remember that number in this form, you'll get a certain 70% memory for it. But if I get you to chunk it 
like and say 923-864-571 chunking, you immediately improve, increase your memory capacity by chunking the information. Your, your short-term memory <coughs> only has a limited capacity of about 7 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2, 7 bits of information. But you can collapse bits of information into single units uh, and, and increase your capacity. And that's what stories do. They chunk information into manageable bits. And that may, makes them more memorable, makes you more memorable. But beware, because the problem, one problem with stories is they can foster stereotypes and people can, depending on the story, people can misremember the dynamic of the story rather than the specifics of you, so you have to be judicious about them. Uh, just to say, to, to highlight the frontal lobes of the brain, where a lot of the working memory is going on, they're working overtime. One reason you can freeze in an interview or when <coughs> giving public a talk publicly, one reason you can freeze is because uh, stress shoots out a hormone called cortisol. And you can do an experiment in the memory lab here where you can volunteer to give cortisol samples and look at its relationship to memory. The cortisol in big quantities disrupts both your hippocampal memory system and your frontal lobes. And so you can end up being like a rabbit in the headlights, unable to, to think, even though you may know the answer perfectly well. That's why you know, learning to, to relax yourself and learning methods for relaxing and learning many of these are very important thing to, 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 to do before an interview. But you know, so the frontal lobes, you want to take care of them. <laughs> and um, you know, this is just a, a pet study of you know, what's happening in the brain. Let's imagine this is an interviewer. And uh, the top left is the part of the brain that's activated when someone's just passively li listening to words, OK, in the scanner. They're just told, listen to these words. Now, if you have an unengaged interviewer, they'll be listening to your words Flowing, flowing over them. In fact, the one the top right there is what the parts of the brain activated when you're listening to words. If they're listening to words, there's a real danger that they, they just kind of activate the language processing parts of the brain. And if they just activate <coughs> them, they won't be remembered terribly well. So that's why it's important to be lively, to have variations in your tone of voice, to try and uh, maximize the chance that you're not just going to be in the room listening to droning language, giving facts, you know, giving answers. Um, once you get the interviewer speaking words, you're getting activation more further forward in the brain, particularly in the left side. But here, um, if you get them generating verbs from nouns, so uh, you make, make a, a verb that comes from the word boat, might be sail, for instance, you really activate the frontal lobes of your brain. And your challenge should be to activate the frontal lobes of your brain and of your interviewers in a constructive way, not in a kind of destructive way of the examples Peter gave. And you can do this by uh, you know, good, good stories and good examples or, or, or setting them up, saying, well, I, I once had this, for instance, I once had this real problem of a member of a person I was supervising who just wasn't coming in at the time. The moment you say that, immediately you're getting this going on in the frontal lobes of the interviewers because they want to know the answer. Okay? That's the power of stories. And they will never forget, they won't forget what you said there because you have actively engaged them. So that's why it's so important you know, when you're, if you're giving a talk, you want to try and give little exercises and keep people engaged so they don't just slip into the passive television watching <coughs> words washing through the posterior parts of the brain, but you're actively engaging the audience in generating things. And that's true of, of interviewers as well. So uh, finally, just about attention. This is the challenge for interview panel. Um, I've told you about 48% forgotten. Uh, and uh, if, you're in, if you're in an interview panel, very, and I've been in a lot, and I can tell you it's very hard 
keep your minds in what you're doing. That being said, if you get someone who's really sparky and really confident and interesting, that person will stand out, so that can be an advantage. And just finally, for memory, don't forget how little people remember. And if you're doing a present, so in, interviews, in many interviews these days, you'll have to do a presentation as well. So, now, but even in the interview, if you're asked to you know, give a two minute, three minute summary, there's no harm in repetition. An old lecturing guideline, say what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you just said, okay? Without being repetitive. But it needs several repetitions sometimes to get things into things together. I'll finish there. Thank you. Now we have uh, time for a few questions for uh, Ian and Peter, but I really like that slide where you had different parts of the brain where people were passively listening and then actively engaged, because I know we've all told stories that go a little too long and you kind of see people glaze over and you think if I could just throw in you know, a moment where, and then he got punched in the face, that's when people just start listening again you know, and start thinking about it. Um, so I might ask you actually, on, on that note, if you do see, you know, as we all do, somebody kind of going into that TV watching part of your brain, um, whether it's in an interview or whether you're just telling a story or whether you're giving a, a lecture in front of a big crowd, is there anything, because um, I'm sure we, we all have been there, is there anything either of you can, can say that does snap people back? What brings them back instantly? How do you get somebody who you're talking to out of that sort of couch potato? I'll give you the uh, the joke anecdote, which is the story about in a lot of interviews, people like to put you under pressure. And there was one famous story about the guy when he walked in for interview, the guy just he started, said, tell me about yourself. And the moment he started talking about himself, he just pulled up a paper and started reading the paper. And uh, this guy was going, what the hell's going on? So uh, he just took out a match and lit the paper. And uh, <laughs> that was the interview or I'll break it. Maybe a bit more dramatic than you want. But uh, well, I'll, give, I'll just give my, my story, which is about mind wandering, then I'll give an answer to that. Uh, my sister in law, many years ago, was on a train in London and the time it took eight hours to get to Glasgow. And she met an elderly cousin of hers, an elderly woman who was a very morose, uh, not good company, and she was faced with eight hours uh, with her. And worse still, she just found out her, her elderly cousin was recently bereaved. And um, uh, so it was a very, very tough journey and about somewhere around the Lake District, my sister-in-law was a slightly scatty person was looking out her, her mind was half out of the window of the hills of the Lake District and then she heard herself saying, and tell me, is your husband still dead? <laughs> so, so that was an example of the posterior parts of the brain, that was a red hammer situation where she was, she was not focusing, but yeah, the answer, the answer, if you see him, if you, and you do, you lose audiences, and you lose interview panels, and nothing will switch them back. <coughs> yeah, well, an interview panel, you have to be careful. With an audience, there's lots of things you can do. An interview panel saying, for instance, for instance, I once had a real problem with, or I once had this real challenge. Just doing that immediately switches on the front of the lobes, because people are predicted. They, they want we want to know the answer to things, the power of the story. So just that's, that's why in inserting stories into your answers to questions, not too many, but just enough that it eases them. Oh, I want to know the answer to this. And just very quickly, the one other thing is uh, ask them a question. It's the easiest way to wake them up. If they are bored, you say, have I said enough? Do you want me to give you another yeah, example? Yeah, yeah. Suddenly they're going, Christ, I better wake up now. And uh, <laughs> you, you, that, that'll wake them up. Yeah, sure, you ticked off with the question before we talk. Um, speaking of which, then, I guess we have uh, questions in the audience. Does anybody want to, to go first and throw that out and get time here? Just wait till the mic gets to you. Do we have any over here? We can do the mic in advance. Yeah. Just what the last thing you said. Asking the interviewer a question. Um, would there be, say, a top three good questions that spring to mind in that situation? No, there's no uh, right answer because the whole point of that question is you're asking a question that interests you because you're interested in the job. So when someone says, have a good question prepared, it should be a good question because you're interested in the job. You might just go into interviews, but we don't really want the job. We don't really know what we're there, so we go, 
well, can you tell me why your company is so successful and why you're so amazing? I mean, that's not the question they want to hear. They want to know why you're interested. So if you can ask them something that's wrong with their website or something that you don't seem to understand, like, why do you do it this way and why does that happen? They might actually go, geez, I don't even know why we do it that way. It's a good question. So they, all they're asking, when you ask that question and they say, do you have any questions for us? It just gives them an idea of, do you know anything about your company? So if you say nothing, that's a bad start. But it's not a great start to just ask a really stupid question for the sake of it. I better ask them something. So it comes back to the point, people who get jobs go to an interview where they really want a job. Where you really want a job, you ask real questions that you care about, and that comes across. Thanks. Hi, thank you for an interesting call here. Uh, sorry, interesting uh, lecture here. Um, this might be a bit off, but what can you tell us about those who did a bigger red hammer? Um, you either weren't doing the sums, um, or, or they were too easy for you, um, or you were very good at very good at sums, and so it didn't occupy your uh, working memory capacity quite so much. It's far from foolproof. Um, and people have idiosyncrasy. For some people, red is not embedded in their particular <coughs> brains, it's the most common color. So it's, it's just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, it was a very interesting lecture. Um, I have just two kind of short questions. Um, the first one was, that I thought it was very interesting what you said, uh, Peter, about waiting three or four seconds and almost answer a question if you're not sure the answer. Just want to be able to elaborate on that a little bit, or because I, some, I would regularly feel under pressure to answer very quickly. And then the second pair, uh, my second question is: Is there anything you can do to improve your working memory? So I think that's also important, maybe for interviews. I'll, I'll answer the first one. You can answer the second one. The first one is basically the simple thing that you can do is just they ask you a question, you don't know the answer, and you go, "Do you mind if I take a few seconds to think about it?" They're never going to say absolutely not, give me an answer straight away. But the fact is, nobody feels confident enough to say that. Um, because that's better. What you can do is just sit there and think for 10 seconds, but they're going, what the hell is going on? They're not speaking. So, but if you actually say, if you come across and say, do you mind if I, I think about it for a few seconds? At least that silence is there for not an awkward silence because they're thinking about it. Um, but you just need to have the confidence to do that. So that's what I would say. In terms of working memory, can you improve it? <coughs> I'm just catching your attention there. <laughs> <laughs> by, deliberately that pausing, you away. <laughs> by deliberately pausing for three or four seconds. That sounded like quite a long time to all of us there. I was deliberately doing it because it caught your attention. It, carefully done, it can put you a little bit more in control of the interview. Ten seconds would be too long. It would be better to do as Peter suggested. But actually three or four seconds if you don't do it all the time can be actually quite a powerful way of waking someone up and getting them attention because you're, anything that is not predictable will, will, will gather someone's attention okay and just not immediately answering will make people will actually switch on the front of it, okay so in terms of working memory capacity the research is that younger people can improve the working memory capacities by uh, basically uh, doing gradually expanding the amount of stuff they have to hold in mind. And there's various studies you can actually see improve, uh, even improve your intelligence that way. So, 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 so most mental functions from arithmetic to maths to English you can improve the practice and with gradually increasing the amount of labor. Um, Hi. Um, at some point you mentioned about the Chinese and the Americans, yeah. and I did it for that point, but I wanted to do it. It's just, a, it's just a study done at Harvard where uh, when they tested Americans and Chinese of an age of 20, 25, there was no difference in terms of their ability to recall and their memory capacity. But when they did the same study for 75 to 80 year olds, Chinese and Americans, the Chinese were much stronger. And this study said it was due to the fact that in China, 
getting older was a good thing, you were looked on as wiser and more revered, whereas in America, being older, you were looked on as more of a nuisance, and therefore that affected people's own ability to remember. And that's just what the study said. Yeah, no, the unconscious, um, there's a study, John Barr in New York got people of your age to come in to, uh, to do a study of sorting words into sentences, meaningful sentences. And we know to them, half of them, but some of the words were related to aging, like gray, Florida, walking stick. The other half didn't. But they had no idea, they weren't consciously aware that they had these words. And when they finished the experiment, they thought they had finished, but they weren't. They were observed as they walked to the lifts. And the people who had been exposed to the aging related words walked significantly slower than the people. So just even the unconscious priming of the concept of age has influences. And if that's true for younger people, that would probably be less true in China. But if that was true for, for younger people, what would it be like for the older people themselves? So there's a huge job of work to be done of people shaking off these unconscious influences on their behavior. And there's lots of other groups, stereotyped groups, who are disadvantaged in interviews who do something the same kind of thing. And incidentally, uh, people who people who are less vulnerable to these stereotype threats, if you like, the more working memory capacity you have. It's when your working memory capacity is occupied with stress or with preoccupation or with worry, you're more vulnerable to these kind of threats. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Um, is there any gender difference between working memory or the ability? You know, anecdotal evidence says that females generally are better at multitasking than males. Uh, is that, you know, you had a difference between the Chinese and the Americans. Have any studies been done on a gender basis? I don't think there are any, I don't think there are any significant gender differences. Uh, it's, it's in working memory or, or multitasking. It's, um, uh, it's a lot of it's to do with uh, habit and uh, for people to learn. It's not really a main difference. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to Thanks a million. Uh, it's a great talk, very interesting. Um, when you're talking about working memory and, and, and capacity, I suppose um, you're not able to remember as much if you feel under pressure. And to prepare in advance will give you the ability then to be able to, things will bubble up. What kind of questions, Peter, would you say that you should be preparing, maybe five or six, that everybody should prepare for every interview? Tell me about yourself, walk me through your CV, tell me where your strengths are. Um, and th there are two or three of the basics. Um, and then it comes down to the interview you're doing. Every interview, if there any way about seasoned interviewer, it depends on what the role is. So if you're going for a sales role, they're going to look for someone who's got influencing skills, someone who's um, outgoing, <coughs> someone who's going to meet targets. So therefore, one of the questions should be, give an example about a time in the past you have to hit a hard target. Give me an example about a time you persevered or you influenced someone who was outside your span of control. If you go for a role as an accountant, it might be around organizational skills, prioritization of tasks, um, and numerical ability. And then they're going to ask you questions around that. So the first thing is, what's the role you're going for? And all roles have about three or four key competencies. And once you understand what they are, most companies will tell you what the competencies they're interviewing you against. You can then practice. And there, it's just about having examples. Uh, but know what the competencies are, and then have the examples around. As long as that's example and somewhat of a story, um, you know, it'll be a lot easier to remember. But everybody here to get started with, just so you know, the interviewer can relax, is, oh, can you just run me through your CV? And that's often because the interviewer has even bothered to read your CV before they walk into the room. But the amount of people who know that's coming up and don't realize how long they have to speak for, how many words they should speak for, and, and how, well, how much they can actually throw in. Because that's an open question. You get very few questions where you get to say whatever you want. So you should use that question and be able to throw in things that may not come up later in the interview. Yeah, um, I work with 
in the first or sort of work with students in coaching or in interviews, and one good uh, tip we often give in, in answering uh, the competency based questions is the acronym CAR. C for context, A for action, R for result, and R for reflection. So if you think of that when you're ask, answering a competency based question, what was the context? What did you do? What was the outcome of you acting on the world? And what did you learn from it? So I think it's a good kind of structure. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of them. When we have STAR, which is situation, task, action, result, what was the situation? What was the task you did? What were the actions you did in that task? And guess what? What actually happened at the end? It doesn't matter if it's a good or bad result, but the amount of people forget to tell you what happened at the end. So acronyms do help, and every example in the world can use the CAR or the STAR format. Um, and it really helps. Uh, the first one's the most important the context of the situation, because when you're able to say five years ago, while I was working in this role, in this task, you're able to bring yourself back to that situation and remember it. And once you can remember it, it makes it a lot easier for you to talk about. It. I think um, I think we're going to have to leave it there. If you have more questions, um, you know, I'm sure Ian here would be happy to answer them. Um, just to remind you, tomorrow's our table points, and if you did like this event, uh, we would ask you that you uh, make a small uh, donation at the back. Uh, it's a new model for us, so we're just trying it out. But let's have a big warm round of applause for people.